the invitation to deliver the um, uh, algebra lecture. Um, I thought I'd share a story before I start of a new creation, uh, innovation in Cambridge, which is a car powered not by petrol, but by faith. And to get going, all you have to do is say, thank God, and the car drives off. <laughs> and when you want it to stop, you just say, amen. So the Archbishop of Canterbury thought he'd try out this car. So he sat in it, and Archbishop Justin said, thank God, and off it went. And he said, thank God again, when he felt it was going too slowly, and it went a bit faster, it was going up a hill, and it came down the other side, and he said, amen, and nothing happened. And so he said, Amen, a bit more loudly, and still nothing happened. And then he shouted, Amen, and the car screeched to a halt at the edge of a precipice with two wheels over the edge. And then, of course, he went back and said, Thank God. You can put any religious leader you want to uh, uh, at, the, at the car. So, no, it's a great pleasure to be here. and, and, um, um, and this is a subject very close to my heart, in fact, I'm sure to all of us, the place of religion and belief and faith in international relations and foreign affairs. Now, in 1999, an American sociologist called Peter, oops, wrong one. there we go, Peter Berger, noted, and there you have the quotation, the world is as furiously religious as it ever was, and in some places more so than ever. And he called that process desecularization. In the same year, the economist, in its millennium issue, published in December of 1999, published the obituary of God. And in the article, the title was God, after a lengthy career, the Almighty recently passed into history, or did he? The reader was informed that the test will come on Judgment Day when man, we are told, will meet his maker, or will it be God meeting his? So just 17 or so years ago, the Economist was predicting the end of religion and the end of God, the obituary of God, how the world has changed. With 2020 hindsight, it's clear that Berger's words were more prescient than those of The Economist, who, to be fair, published a book in 2007 called God is Back. The question I want us to consider tonight is to what extent have we absorbed the implications that in most parts of the world, the most powerful actors are religious. The 2012 Pew survey, and I do recommend the Pew Foundation the States for uh, surveys of the changing landscape, the Pew survey stated that 85% of the world's population identify themselves as belonging to a specific religion. And even in this country, which we regard as a secular country, According to the 2011 census, 75% identified with a religion as well. So 85% of the world. Now, what I'd like to explore are the implications of the fact that the religious landscape is changing. And that there is religious diversity, not just in the West, in this country, in Europe, but actually around the world. And I'd like to explore with you how religion interacts at local, national and international levels, and is key to, for foster, key to fostering both a flourishing and rich society, but also, let's be honest, contributes to instability and violence and conflict. In other words, religion and society are engaged in a two-way relationship, both for good and for ill, one being shaped by the other and, of course, vice versa. Now, this picture sounds complicated, and it is. But it's made even more complicated by the growth of fanaticism and violent extremism. Today, most of that is spent at the Foreign Office exploring the place of violent extremism and what interfaith dialogue can do in terms of um, responding to such extremism. Because on the one hand, we have a suspicion that religion is a primary source of all the world's ills, a blanket denial of legitimacy, on the one hand, you have this religion blamed for all the world's ills, and on the other hand, a blanket denial of legitimacy of non-religious approaches to life. And somehow we have to work out a way of rubbing along together, whether we're secular or religious, whether we're Jew, Christian, Muslim, or any other faith tradition. And the world is changing. 
there is increasing movement of people and ideas. And so religious monopolies are beginning to fall. For example, we tend to think of Eastern Europe as dominated by the Orthodox churches of Russia, of Ukraine, of Serbia. Or we think of India dominated by Hinduism, the largest religion, of course. But according to The Economist, there are more Christians in China than members of the Communist Party. Atheist country, with 87 million members of the Communist Party, there are more Christians in China than members of the Communist Party. In Russia, although dominated by the Russian Orthodox Church, there are more Muslims in Russia than any other European country, 12% or 17 million of the population, and 50% of the military, the Russian military, 1.1 million people, 50% are Muslim. This is astonishing. The point is this, when there is a crisis involving religion, government officials and activists on the ground need the means to address the situation, which requires a nuanced approach to religious ethnic identity. There is a need for what I would call religious literacy, a basic level of knowledge about religion and belief, because if there is illiteracy, this is what happens. The Harvard Divinity School Pluralism Project, or Religious Literacy Project, has proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that illiteracy fuels conflict. Now, the need to improve religious literacy is reinforced by the fact that those who identify themselves as religious don't exist within religious communities, they live in the real world. This means that, as I said earlier this morning at the FCO, policymakers and politicians need to be better informed so that they better uh, sustain their communities and manage tension and conflict um, more uh, appropriately. So I'll give you one, actually, I'll tell you something that was said this morning that we can keep between us. Okay. One of the recommendations that come, came out of the Foreign Office discussions today was that just as much as we have military attaches in every embassy and we have experts on security, experts on economics, we need religion attaches. We need people within our embassies around the world, the British embassies around the world, that have an expertise in religion and belief. Well, that's part of their portfolio. It's not rocket science, but it's vital. Because so many conflicts in this world become religionized, whether they're religious or not. People caught up in conflict can seek to define and sharpen differences between us and them, the self and the other, and they religionize a conflict in order to rally support. The Wolf Institute has specialized in the encounter between religion and belief, religion, civil society, and foreign affairs for two decades, and we've been teaching at the Foreign Office and training uh, diplomats at different levels to take that seriously. The British ambassador to the Holy See, just retired actually, just been replaced, uh, called Nigel Baker, was a great propo proponent of training the FCO on religion and belief. Now there he is at the centre of the Roman Catholic Church. How many Catholics are there in the world? Anybody know? Well, we've got some. This is how I make sure you stay awake with me, right? <laughs> Asking questions. Okay, what have we got? I heard 700 something. 750 million. Excellent. 700. Anyone else? You happy with that? Should we stick with that? 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion Catholics. Not talking about Christians. 1.2 billion Catholics. One Pope, of course. 400,000 Catholic priests around the world. 5,000 bishops around the world. 106 Holy See. Um, embassies around the world. Incredible influence of one denomination, of one religion. And that's why we need to understand religion and belief. The Pope, who's on Twitter, is followed by nearly 20 million people. And I'm sure it's going up all the time. And he follows eight people. And do you want to know who they are? Um, if my phone was switched on, I'd look it up, but I'll tell you who they are. It's actually 
Pontifex, which is his twi Twitter name, wonderful name. Anyone who has Latin would appreciate that. Um, when he tweets, or when he someone tweets for him, let's be honest. Um, Spanish, French, Dutch, German, so the eight he follows are actually the Pope as well, just in different languages. <laughs> <it's fantastic>. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The traditional model of understanding relations, uh, of not really talking about religion. You know, remember when Tony Blair was inter interviewed by, I think it was a Telegraph, and he was asked whether he prayed with George Bush, and Alistair Campbell, his spin doctor, said, we don't do religion, and interrupted the interviewer. The fact is, we do do religion. Whether we're religious or not, this world does religion. To understand the significance of it, bear with me for a few minutes while I just run through the demographics. I should have asked you how many Christians and Muslims there are in the world, but there you have your answer, okay? Two largest religions of the world, Christianity and Islam, 2.2 billion and 1.6 billion are growing dramatically. Dramatically, especially in what's called the Global South. According to a 2013 report by the Centre for the Study of Global Christianity, the proportion of Christians located in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, known as the Global South, will increase from 41%, as it was in 1970, to 65% in just two, in 2020. So the growth of Christianity comes from the Global South. In Europe and North America, Christianity is declining as a percentage of the population. Christianity will grow to 2.7 billion by 2030, and the growth comes from that group, evangelicals and Pentecostals. The face of Christianity is changing. The traditional face of Christianity, the established churches, Church of England, mainstream churches, the Roman Catholic Church, um, is, and the free churches, is being replaced by the growth of evangelism and Pentecostal Christianity, which will grow to 700 million, second in size to Catholics. Now, that is an increase of tenfold since 1970. So, okay, there's Christianity. As much as we need to reflect on Christianity, of course, we need to think about the implications of the growth of Islam. The world's Muslim population is increasing even faster than the Christian population, from 1.6 billion, as I showed you, to 2.2 billion in 2030 when Muslims will make up 26.5% of the world's projected population of 8.3 billion. The largest Muslim country in the world today is? Indonesia. Excellent. Followed by? Pakistan. Excellent. You're on a roll. Followed by? Uh, Bangladesh. Oh, okay. India. India, thank you. <laughs> then Bangladesh. And then Egypt. <laughs> yes. We tend to think Islam just Arab, right? No. The largest Muslim country in the world is thousands of miles away from the birthplace of Islam. Egypt is the largest Arab. Oh, sorry. Uh, was that up there? Did I already have my give it away? Okay. <coughs> and one of the reasons why the Muslim population is growing faster than the Christian population um, is that there's a higher fertility rate, there are a younger population, um, and soon enter the sort of more reproductive years, improved health and economic conditions in Muslim majority countries, and a decline in child mortality rates. Now, one of the implications of this changing religious landscape is that <coughs> countries with large Muslim populations will also have significant Christian populations, and vice versa. <coughs> Indonesia. 200 million Muslims, 25 million Christians. Even India, with over 800 million Muslims, has nearly 180 million, sorry, 800 million Hindus, has nearly 180 million Muslims, and over 30 million Christians. We're talking astonishing numbers. Nigeria, 81 million Muslims, and 80 million Christians, almost half and half. Now, it's not a surprise that in some of these countries, like Nigeria, we're seeing really serious examples of conflict. And what might be tribal conflict actually is dressed up as a religious conflict. But don't just think the conflict is about Islam. In China, you've got areas of conflict between the Chinese and, of course, the followers of the Dalai Lama in Tibet. In Tibet. 
In Israel, we've got an interesting situation. Israel, including Jerusalem, but not the West Bank or Gaza. In Israel, nearly 25% of the population are not Jewish. 23% Muslim, 2% Christian. A dramatic increase in the minority's population in a Jewish state from 14% in 1990 to about 25% in a couple of years. An astonishing growth of, non, of, of minorities, non-Jewish minorities, in a country where the tension states seem to be reducing. And the other change that we're witnessing is the growth of the, what's called the nons. Sociologists like to call them nons. Non-affiliate people who do not identify with any religious institution or any particular religion. In this country, the number doubled between the census of 2001 and 2011 from 12 to 25 percent and is growing rapidly again. If you're interested in Europe, This is what's happening. Europe is the only country, uh, sorry, region to see a projected decline in its total population between 2010 and 2015. And although Christians will continue to be the largest group, it will drop by about 100 million from 555, as you can see, to 455 in 2050. And the minority communities, the largest being Islam, will grow dramatically, but still be quite small sort of perceived fear, I hear, of Islam in Europe, but still a small minority. The largest growth will come from the religious unaffiliated, sorry, the unaffiliated people, the nons, the people who are not affiliated with any particular religion. So, a very brief run through of the demographics, but it, it shows you, I hope, why it's so important to understand the change in the religious landscape, because unless we get our heads around it, it will be much harder, if not impossible, to accomplish the sorts of goals that politicians want to achieve. Development objectives, conflict resolution, and the promotion of social and human rights. Religion, it seems to me, cannot be separated from international affairs. Logic cannot be liberated from beliefs that claim to transcend it. Religious motivation does not disappear because we don't want to mention it. We have to face up to the changes, the demographics, the contemporary religious landscape, which is, as you can see, a mosaic of different religions and beliefs, each with multiple strands influencing and being influenced by the society in which we live. Religion is both a unifier and a divider, and understanding its role requires that sensitivity, that minimum level of knowledge, and to realise that religion is in a state of flux. Yes, it's changing. It's not static, it's not a homogeneous block, it is fluid. And as tempting as it is to say that it does not change, that is a mistake. Religion is far more complicated. But I would suggest there are three trends going on in the world that I think will help us under, uh, get, a, get a handle on the changing religious landscape. And this is the first. Increasing religious pluralism and diversity. I would suggest that all religious minorities are in decline. Let's take Europe. Christianity can no longer be portrayed as the dominant host religion. The intrinsic relationship between Christianity and authority is being weakened. In the UK, we are becoming less Christian, less religious and more diverse. The church no longer holds that kind of authority that it once did. I gave you the census increase in the secular, the census decrease in the number of Christians from 71% to 59% in just 10 years, identifying as Christians. And that means the privileged position of, for example, the Church of England needs to be questioned. I'm going to touch on our report on the religion and belief in British public life in a moment, but I think we do have to question why there are how many Anglican bishops in the House of Lords? Anybody know? Hazard a guess. Twelve. Okay, a bit more. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Wrong. I can say that because my daughter. Twenty-two. Twenty-six. Twenty-six. Yeah, you're still wrong. <laughs> so twenty-six Anglican bishops in the House of Lords who are there simply because they are Church of England bishops. We have to ask ourselves that question: Why? The monarch is the head of the Church of England, but she's monarch of the whole country. When she goes to Scotland, she becomes head 
in the Church of Scotland? Because that's the established church in Scotland. <clears throat> These are fundamental questions. I mentioned the changing uh, face of Christianity. 400 new churches, new Pentecostal, sorry, 700 Pentecostal churches were started between 2005 and 2012 in London in seven years. 700 new Pentecostal churches. So the face of Christianity in this country is changing dramatically. And this growth is not un uncommon. Our country is based on immigration. Huguenots, Irish, Jews, Asians, different communities, and the growth of Pentecostal churches is part of that. But not just Christians. More than one generation of Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs have grown up knowing no other home than Britain. They're no longer hosted outsiders, as perhaps their parents and grandparents might have felt. Jews have a longer history having been here or returned to this country in 1656 under Cromwell. But the inevitable question is, how, do we, how can we be true to our own faith and to our national identity? What does it mean to be British and religious of whatever faith that we might be? The Commission on Religion and Belief that was established and convened by the Wolf Institute in 2013 ran for two years until 2015. I have one or two copies of our report, but you can also find it online. It met over a number of weekends. It had public hearings around the country, including Belfast, Glasgow, Leeds, Cardiff, London, Birmingham, and Leicester, and issued a series of recommendations to government about the place of religion and belief. I won't read them all as interesting as they are. <laughs> but the point it made is this. We are a different society than we were in 1950 when the only major non-Christian minority were Jews who numbered one in 150. But now Jews are fourth after Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs in terms of non-Christian minorities. And minorities are not just one in 150 in this country, but one in 10. The landscape has changed, and I mentioned also the growth of uh, secularism. But not just in this country, we're seeing the landscape changing. Obviously, in Europe as a whole. Germany. The opening of the doors in Germany in 2015 by the German government, more than one million, mainly Muslim, migrants or refugees will change the face, of course, of Germany. And what is the government of Germany doing? They're investing very heavily in Islamic studies in universities, providing the Muslim community and German Muslims to integrate more easily and to understand what it means to be German and Muslim. The opening up of new spaces for political engagement through civil society. The use of Germans who were born Muslim in Germany to help Muslims who are coming into Germany to integrate better and understand what German values and customs and practices actually mean. The growth of refugee churches in Germany is an astonishing phenomenon for anybody who has visited there. In my view, the lack of violence in Germany. A million people come within 18 months to a country. It's astonishing there has been such little violence and may that continue. There has been and there are outbreaks of violence in Germany, but they're relatively few and handled much better, it seems to me, than in our country. At the same time, the pluralist society that we have is facing tensions and conflict, both within and between faith communities. This feeds anti-Semitism, this feeds Islamophobia, this feeds, frankly, anti-Christian hatred. And because the communication of ideas travels so quickly, it doesn't take much for an incident in one part of the world, take Israel-Palestine, to transfer onto the streets of London, or in Kashmir, to transfer onto the streets of Bradford. France, which appears on paper to be a very diverse society, largest Muslim population in Europe, how many, anybody know? Six million, exactly. The largest Muslim population. Actually, Germany may have caught up by now. But nevertheless, six million Muslims in France, it seems on paper, particularly in the urban areas, to be a diverse society, but in reality is predominantly mono or bicultural. What I would call uh, a parallel, parallel lives. These 
groups don't meet each other, French, mainly North African Arabs, mainly Muslim, are not meeting other French communities because they live in a different place. And this sense of separation has only increased since the Paris attacks in January and November 2015, where the government have implemented measures towards a much more authoritarian governance and differentiation among, along religious ethnic lines. And in these circumstances, it's relatively easy for extremists of whatever persuasion to develop myths and misinformation and stir up race and religious hatred. But before you think that this diversity that I'm talking about, this pluralism, is limited to the global north, let me identify one or two other areas that may surprise you where I would suggest there is a growth of pluralism. Qatar. Some of you might have been to Qatar. 250,000 Qatari citizens, all Muslim of course, Arab, living in a country of two and a half million, mainly expatriates, working in services and other sectors to support that society. There are more Christians in Qatar than Qataris. And not only Christians, but there are Hindus and Buddhists, non Abraham, people working in Qatar. So although Islam remains a state religion, it is one of many, or several I should say, world religions including Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, and actually pockets of Sikhs and also Jews. And that's not unique to Qatar. In other Gulf countries, UAE, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, have since the early 1970s been grappling with these same challenges. So I would suggest that there are actually a, a, a variety of pluralisms in these countries which we've always assumed to be homogeneous. So this religious landscape is complicated and there needs to be a reconstruction of identity which can take a benign, pious form or a radically extremist form. So that's the first theme I'd identify in the complicated religious landscape and that is the growth of pluralism and the decline of religious monopolies. The second are growing tensions between the religion, citizenship, and the nation state. So closely connected with pluralism is a growing tension between these factors. Now, before the rise of the nation state in the 19th century, Jews, Christians, and Muslims defined themselves in terms of their shared laws, customs, practices, beliefs, and if and when they had to move, they would take their laws, values, and beliefs with them. So it wasn't so much territory that defined their identity, but values and a way of life. And that role was often played by religion. Often these groups would move from one territory to another with different languages, but without losing any sense of belonging. The rise of the nation state changed that dramatically in the late 19th century. It privileged territorial identity and, generally speaking, one language. Now, a characteristic of the contemporary religious landscape is that there are multiple forms of identity, ethnic, cultural, religious. What scholars call hybrid identities. And this is in conflict with the growth of a sort of increased nationalism and religious ethnic nationalism in some parts of Europe. For example, the example of the growth of the, the Catalan Basque movement for independence in Spain or the Iberian Peninsula. But there is no reason why one cannot be Catalan and Spanish, or Quebecois and Canadian, or Scottish and British, just as much as why one couldn't be Muslim and French, Indian and Jewish, Egyptian and Christian. But with the pressures, there is increasing tension holding that natural hybrid identity together. Let me illustrate that by telling you a joke. This is a story about a Jew from Poland in 1900. Poland had a very big Jewish community before the war. And this Jew from Poland went from Warsaw to New York. And then he came back and he told his friends what he'd seen. He said it was amazing. He said, I met a Jew who was a communist, 
and I met a Jew who was a capitalist. I met a Jew who was religious, I met a Jew who was secular, I met a Jew who was orthodox, I met a Jew who was reform, I met a Jew who was liberal. It was amazing. And his friend said, what's so strange? There are lots of Jews in New York. He said, you don't understand, it was the same Jew. <laughs> yeah. We hold, that's hybrid identity, we hold these identities together. But the pressure on religious ethnic identity today is raising the political temperature. So there are increasing pressures on minority groups to conform to European customs. For example, give me an example. Not the That's right, yeah. Berko or the Mika. Exactly, <coughs> exactly. So pressure on dress. Restrictions on the religious slaughter of animals is a good example. On halal and kosher food. In Greece, to be a Greek is assumed that one is Greek Orthodox. But what about those other religious groups? Other Christian groups who are not Greek Orthodox, let alone Muslims and Jews. Now for those who are outside of what's often seen as the national church, there is a feeling of exclusion if you're not part of that community. It's ever so important that we take seriously those minority groups who are not part of the mainstream. Witnessed most recently, of course, by the incident in Nice, the Burkini. <laughs> what a bizarre situation that we have four police officers telling a woman to undress. But what we forget is that one, it was overturned eventually by the French courts. And secondly, other Mediterranean countries, Italy, for example, did not take on the same practice which implies that this is a specific problem for the French model of laïcité, the French secularist model, which is really struggling to cope with the diversity of French society. In theory, of course, laïcité means we're all equal, right? But in practice, it not only means some are more equal than others, it means those who are not part of that mainstream French secular model are definitely disenfranchised particularly Muslim. So that's the second trend, the tension between those different aspects of one's identity. And the third is more optimistic. Cross-religious partnerships. Now these include formal interfaith dialogue groups, joint political and social action, and the influence, increasing influence of the diaspora communities. Now interfaith dialogue, traditional formal dialogue between people holding different beliefs and belonging to different um, religions and backgrounds have and do play a role in strengthening the bonds of civil society. It helps people feel a positive, be part of a positive national story. Participants seek to engage with each other to discover common grounds, underlying underlie their differences, to try and resolve differences when that's possible, but as importantly, to learn to live with them when it's not possible. We don't want some kind of melting pot where we're all the same. We want to live alongside us, ourselves, in a, a, rich, a rich, vibrant, diverse society, society. And the use of formal interfaith dialogue groups have been supported, by, has been supported by government around the world, in the UK, you have the Near Neighbours programme that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and as far away as Australia, you have the state of Victoria working with the University of Monash, Monash University, for social cohesion and local programmes. And the impact of effective dialogue <coughs> is often unnoticed. We need to hear it a bit more. For example, do you remember when Lee Rigby was killed and murdered a few years ago in South London? The very fact that local faith leaders, Christian, Muslim, and others, called for a calming of the situations meant that it did not develop into something it might have done. What about the incredible work of Christian and Muslim leaders in the Central African Republic during the violence of 2015 that reduced the conflict in that particular zone? I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it, but I do want to say that the formal dialogue that takes place is an effective way of bringing certain groups together to live alongside one another. But alongside the formal dialogue, 
you have a rather uncomfortable cross partnership between groups who do not see eye to eye with each other. By that I mean very conservative minded Christians and Jews and Muslims, for example, who are opposed to issues to do with abortion, pro-choice, coming together in a way that you wouldn't necessarily expect. But for political reasons, they come together on particular partnership programs. Likewise, more liberal-minded Jews, Christians, and Muslims come together for programs of social justice and social action. What does that show us? It shows us that that monolithic assumption of religion is no longer the case. Another example of cross-religious cooperation is humanitarian aid. In 2009, there was a conference in Cambridge called Keeping Faith in Development. I like the title, Keeping Faith, you know where it comes from. And what it showed, it was Christian aid, World Jewish Relief and Islamic Relief coming together to talk about how they would deliver aid in countries of a different religion. So it's Christian aid, delivering aid in a Muslim country, World Jewish Relief, delivering aid in Pakistan, and Islamic Relief, delivering aid in South Sudan, predominantly a Christian society. And what it showed was that because they speak the same language, the language of faith, even they are a different faith, but it's a common language of faith, they were able to deliver aid more effectively than the secular organizations. They were trusted more. And it took the government a few years to realize that they were better off working with faith-based humanitarian aid organizations. Not over and against secular organizations, but alongside secular organizations. There is an example here of uh, a sort of harmonious way of living together. I'd like you just for one minute to shut your eyes. And I'm going to play you some music. And I want you just to imagine and think where is that music coming from. You have to shut your eyes because it's going to be on the screen, so it's going to, be, going to give it away. Just bear with me for 30 seconds. through cheap travel. We've all suffered, I mean, benefited from Ryanair and EasyJet, to travel very easily from one place to another. And what that means 
is that the local is truly global, or the global is truly local. And diaspora communities are becoming even more significant as non-state actors. Now, negatively, this means that a residual conflict, arbitrary boundaries, ethnic and tribal differences can quickly resurface in another part of the world. I mentioned Kashmir and Bradford as an example. But positively, this means we need to be alive to the possibility of promoting human rights, for example, in one geographical region, but for the purpose of the promotion of human rights and equality in another. For example, working with Russian Orthodox Christians in the diaspora is a more effective way of challenging the more conservative attitudes found in parts of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow than the fruit fruitless hours of negotiation that I've been involved in in the dark, dank and chilly halls of the Moscow Patriarch. So in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that the increasing interdependence of the modern world means to adapt the famous words of John Donne, that no country is an island of itself, entire of itself. No people, no culture, no religion is independent. We are part of an interconnected island. And it must be clear to us all that we cannot just focus on the rational motivators to understand society, security of economics and ignore the role of religion because the changing religious landscape epitomizes a complicated, multifaceted and fragmented society. Religions, this is one thing you take away with you, all religions have good digestion systems. And that means they change and develop over time. And understanding that digestion system, understanding that change, is no longer an option. It is essential. The challenge today is to enhance, enhance our capacity to read this most potent sign 